to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ writing to christians the apostle john said beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of Answering Denominational Doctrine. Today we're going to be considering the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And as we think about these doctrines and teachings, please understand we have no animosity in our hearts toward any individual or person. Our only desire is to compare the teaching of men with the Word of God and to follow the teaching of God. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. As always, we encourage you to visit the local congregation of the Lord's people, the Church of Christ, in your area. You'll find people there who love God, who love the Bible, and who are concerned about lost souls. Please visit one of their assemblies on Sunday or Wednesday. They'd be happy to have you as a guest. If you've got a Bible question or would like to study the Scriptures further, please let them know as well. Friend, we'd also like to help you in your study of the divine will of God here at the Gospel of Christ. We have a wide variety of free resources that will help you in searching the Scriptures. All of our video lessons, audio lessons, transcripts are available online free of charge. If you'd like to have a, a hard copy of that for your DVD player or CD, Player, you can write to us as well, call us or email us. We'd be happy to get that to you. And with the boom in technology today, we encourage you to check out our new apps, both on the Google Play Store and on the Apple Store for the Gospel of Christ program. Today we're thinking about doctrines of the Catholic Church, and we're examining these doctrines with the teaching of the Scripture. And friend, with every lesson in this series, from the outset we have tried to express there are good, moral people in this religious group who are concerned about things of a religious nature, who are dedicated and committed, and who are kind, friendly people. We understand that. Our we have no animosity toward those people at all. In fact, we're concerned about souls and more than anything, we want to help people go to heaven. But today we're going to be looking at the doctrines, the teachings of the Catholic Church and comparing those with the Bible to see if the two mesh. If they do mesh, then the encouragement of course is to obey God and to obey the Bible. If they do not mesh, then friend, changes need to be made as well. We begin our series of lessons thinking about our study today, thinking about the Catholic doctrine by examining the foundational element that is the Catholic view of authority, Bible authority specifically. What does the Catholic Church believe and, and teach about the Bible and its authority down to mankind? Well, friend, the Catholic Church teaches that while, yes, the Bible may be uh, authoritative, it's not the sole authority, it's not the only authority, and you may need help along with that as well. Let me illustrate this to you from the, the Sunday, our Sunday visitor, which is uh, in the book, The Faith of Millions, written by John O'Brien, which has kind of become a standard work that is taught, has been taught for years in the Catholic Church. John O'Brien, a cardinal, he, he, he illustrates this when he says these words. Concerning the idea of the Bible not as the only and sole authority, Catholic writer John O'Brien says, from all of which it must be abundantly clear that the Bible alone, listen now, the Bible alone is not a safe 
and competent guide. Why? Because it is now not and has never been accessible to all. Because it is not clear and intelligible to all. And because it does not contain all the truths of the Christian religion. Now friend, I take exception to teachings and ideas like that because the Bible is diametrically opposed to things like that as well. Is the Bible everything we need? Well, it says it is. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The, the Scripture, the Bible, what God has given us, it tells us it's complete, it thoroughly equips us, and it's everything we need. I want you to think about the words of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Peter says that according to His divine will, God has given to us all things. Now listen to this, all things for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. Through the knowledge of God found in the Scripture, we have everything we need to live a good life and to be a godly person. You see, the Bible claims it's truth. Jesus said in His prayer to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said you could know that truth and it would make you free. John chapter 8, verse number 32. But let's think for just a moment about the individual elements of this statement that's made by Mr. O'Brien about the Bible. He first says that the Bible is not a safe and competent guide because it is now not and has never been accessible to all. Well, friend, that's just not true. Any person who desires can have a cop, their own copy of the Bible today, especially in the United States of America and in more and more countries worldwide. The Bible is readily available to all, especially with technology today. Any person who desires can have the Bible in their own language and thus it is accessible to all today. He goes on to say, because it is not clear. The Bible cannot be our only guide. It's not a competent guide because it is not clear and intelligible to all. Well, friend, again, this is contradictory to what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 3 verse 4, When you read, you can understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The Bible tells us to study to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. It requires uh, digging into the Word of God. Acts 17.11 says we must search the Scriptures daily. But friend, to say that the Bible is not clear and intelligible to it all, friend, again, that idea is contradictory to the teaching of Scripture. And then, of course, the latter part of that statement, because it does not contain all the truths of the Christian religion. Again, this is contradictory to what the Word of God says. The Bible does claim it is everything we need for life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. Psalm 119, 160. The entirety of God's Word. Listen to this now. The entirety of God's Word is truth. We have all that we need. We can be complete. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, uh, the Bible teaches in James 1, verse 21, we're to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save our souls. Romans 1, 16 and 17, the Gospel brings God's righteousness to mankind. And so here's what we have. And friend, we make it as plain and as simple as we can. The Catholic religion states, the Bible is not a competent and safe guide because everybody doesn't have it. You may not be able to understand it and because it doesn't contain all truth. And yet the Bible says, Jesus said, God's Word is all truth. Jesus said you could know that truth, John 8 verse 32, and the Bible teaches that we can be saved by the Word of God, Romans 1, 16, the Gospel, not a bunch of other books and oral tradition and ideas of men, but the Gospel is God's power unto salvation. And then, friend, as we think about the idea of authority, 
And that being the fundamental for understanding the Bible and the problem with some of the Catholic religion, please understand as well, the Catholic Church actually claims it is a source of authority today, meaning that what they say, what the Catholic Church says, is also authoritative and therefore from God. John O'Brien in The Faith of Millions on page 148 also illustrates this point when he says, the simple fact is the Bible, like all dead letters, calls for a living interpreter just as the Supreme Court is the authorized living and interpreter of the Constitution, so the Catholic Church is the living, authoritative interpreter of the Bible. Well, friend, may I ask kindly, where did God say that? Where does the Bible teach that I need the Catholic Church to interpret and tell me what the Bible means? Friend, the, listen carefully. There's a lot of things said in this statement that are just flat wrong, according to the Scripture. First, the Bible is not a dead letter, and it does not need a living interpreter. The Bible says the opposite of that. Do you remember Hebrews 4, verse 12? Listen to the contrast. Catholic Church says the Bible is a dead letter, needs a living interpreter. And yet the Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, joints and morrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's not a dead letter that needs a living interpreter. The Bible says it is alive and powerful and sharp and, and its power has the power to pierce men and women's heart today. Just like in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard Jesus with both Lord and Christ, they were cut to the heart. Friend, today, the Word of God is still piercing and pricking people's hearts because of its power. And friend, the idea that somehow the Catholic Church is like the Supreme Court in that it is the official uh, interpreter of the Bible, well, friend, you, you've got to look beyond the Word of God to find that. The Bible doesn't tell you that. The Bible says this, when you read, you can understand. Ephesians 3 verse 4. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, said, Do not be ignorant, but understand the will of the Lord. The Lord Himself said, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Listen, you can read, you're not to be ignorant, and you can know the truth. Well, who can do that? Writing to the individual. The individual has the power to take his Bible, to read it with his own mind, his own intellect, and understand God's will. Now, do I have to uh, be careful in making sure that I read the Bible, that I, that I study the totality of it, that I look to the Word of God without uh, other men's prejudice and bias? Sure, I've got to let the Bible be the guide. But nowhere in Scripture do we find the idea that I need some go-between, that I need some middleman uh, to tell me what the Bible means. If that isn't a sense of coercion and brainwashing, then friend, I would ask, what is? You have the ability. You have, if you have your own copy of the Bible and you can read, you have the ability to understand the Word of God. Then, friend, we mentioned this as well, and this is a, a, another fallacy of Catholicism that millions of people have bought into. And it relates again to the idea of authority. The Catholic Church teaches, at least in certain areas, that the Pope has absolute authority on religious matters, and in certain occasions, he is actually speaking for God. Let me again illustrate that for you. John O'Brien, in The Faith of Millions, on page 126, says this, when the Pope, in his official capacity, some people would call that ex cathedra, when he's sitting in the chair giving doctrine, when the Pope, in his official capacity, proclaims a doctrine on faith or morals binding on the whole church, he is preserved from error. Now, friend, I want you to just stop and think about that idea a little bit. And I want you to think about he's in, the idea that he's infallible, that when he gives a, a doctrine on morals or uh, something of that nature on faith, that he's preserved from error and that it is, he's literally infallible and that's coming from God? Well, friend, again, we ask, where's that at in the Bible? 
the Bible teaches no man's perfect. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sometimes you'll hear the Pope referred to as the vicar of Christ, meaning that he's actually standing in for Christ here on earth and he is representative of giving God's will. Well, the only person who was sinless or infallible was our Lord and Savior. Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. It is God who cannot lie and God who does not lie. Titus 1 verse 2 and Hebrews 6 18. My friend, here's the real kicker. The Bible says the Word of God, the Scriptures from the mouth of God says absolutely nothing about papal infallibility, uh, speaking ex cathedra, or Him being the Vicar of Christ. You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. That has, been pro that has been propagated, pushed on mankind from a religious perspective, and it's almost as though some people like the idea of someone standing up and you know, telling them what to do, but you just don't find that in the Scriptures. The Scriptures tell us, listen carefully now, the Scriptures tell us there is only one person who has all authority. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he told his disciples how to go and, and make disciples and teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But friend, here's a very telling quote from Pope Pius III that helps us to realize a lot of these things are being said with a, uh, with a motive and with a realization in mind, and it's this. People, if people read the Bible for themselves and just the Bible, they're eventually going to realize Catholicism and Christianity, if you take the Bible and learn about Christianity, and then you take that same Bible and look at Catholicism, they're different. They're just not compatible. In fact, the following is an excerpt from, address, from an address by the Cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church in 1503 to Pope Pius III. This comes from the National Library of Paris, folio number 10, 1068, volume 2, page 650 and 651. Here's what those Cardinals said to Pope Pius III. Of all the advice that we can offer your holiness, we must open your eyes well and use all possible force in the matter, namely to permit the reading of the gospel as little as possible in all the countries under your jurisdiction. Let the very little part of the gospel suffice, which is usually read in mass, and let no one be permitted to read more. So long as people will be content with a small amount, your interest will prosper. But as soon as the people want to read more, your interest will fail. Well, why is that? The Bible is the book which more than any other has raised against us the tumults and tempests by which we've almost perished. In fact, this is what they went on to say, in fact, if one compares the teaching of the Bible with what takes place in our churches, he will soon find discord and will realize that our teachings are often different from the Bible and often are still contrary to it. What? If somebody takes their Bible and reads that, they're going to find out that Catholicism is different than the Bible and contrary to it? Well, friend, Absolutely, you can't help but find that out when you take just the Bible and you compare Catholic doctrine against the Word of God. L let me illustrate for you. One of the major uh, fundamental ideas and doctrines among Catholics today is the perpetual virginity of Mary, that Mary was uh, immaculate, there was immaculate conception, and she remained a perpetual virgin all of her life. Now, from the outset, Friend, let me say this. Mary was a fabulous woman in the Bible. Mary was righteous, outstanding. God chose her because of her wonderful character. But the idea that she was a perpetual virgin is just contrary to the teaching of the Bible. Here's what Pope St. Martin I said. He said this, 
If anyone does not properly and truly confess in accord with the Holy Fathers that the Holy Mother of God, an ever virgin and immaculate Mary, in the earliest of the ages, conceived the Holy Spirit without seed, namely, God the Word Himself, specifically and truly, who was born of God the Father before all ages, and that she incorruptibly bore Him, her virginity remaining indestructible, even after the birth, let him be condemned. And so basically the idea is, if you don't believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, you're standing in condemnation. It's a very serious offense. Well again, let's ask, what does the Bible say about that? Matthew affirms, in Matthew 1 verse 18, that Mary was found to be with child before she and Joseph came together. The term came together, according to 1 Corinthians 7, 5 and other places, is representative of sexual intimacy. Ellison comments that the construction of this language is incompatible with the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Bef M M Matthew says, before she and Joseph came together. Why would he say that? if they never came together to begin with. Implied from that is that they did. Here's a clearer passage though. I want you to notice Matthew chapter 1. We'll put it up on your screen. And I want you to notice Matthew chapter 1. Listen to what the scripture says about Mary in verse number 25. Of Joseph that he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and she called his name Jesus. He knew her not until she brought forth the firstborn son again. The idea of until being an adverb of time, looking forward to a time when he did know her. And again, that implies sexual intimacy. It's just not taught in the Bible that Mary was a perpetual virgin. In fact, there are several places that tell us Mary had other children. Let me mention some of those. Uh, and the mentioning of the siblings of Jesus are found in Matthew 12, 46. He had brothers. Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56. He had brothers. Matthew 13, 56. We're told that he has sisters. Uh, one account in Mark chapter 3, they said to Jesus, Your mother and your brothers and your sisters are calling out to you. Clear that the Bible records Jesus had siblings. Now sometimes... People will say, well, the word Adolphos, uh, representative of brother, is sometimes used in a bigger sense, representative of kindreds or cousins. Friend, listen to this now. In the New Testament, Adolphos, Adelphos is never used to represent a cousin. Not in the New Testament, not in the language that we have in the Bible. The Bible says Jesus had brothers and sisters. And so we realize that's contrary to the teaching. That Catholic doctrine about the perpetual virginity of Mary is contrary to clear teaching in the New Testament. Well, here's another one. Another clear teaching that is contradictory to the Bible is this. The Catholic idea of a clergy laity system is not found in Scripture, meaning that you've got people who are revered and venerated and put up on a pedestal such as Mary and Peter and Mother Teresa and the Pope and that then you've got other people who are just ordinary normal people. My friend, this idea, that idea of the clergy laity system, again, is not found in Scripture. Here's the clearest passage of all. Now, if somebody goes to the Catholic, if I went to a Catholic church and I said, uh, who's the main person here? Well, they would say, Father so-and-so runs this diocese or runs this Catholic church. Now, where do we find somebody being referred to by that title in the Bible? Here's what we find. The Catholic Church and Catholic adherents will call the man in charge at the local level Father so-and-so, whatever his last name may be. Here's what the Bible says. And you compare that, clear teaching with Catholicism, with the clear teaching of the Bible. Matthew 23, 9, Jesus said, Call no man father on earth. For you have one father in heaven. The Catholic Church calls the priest father. The Bible says, call no man father. And friend, that is in a religious sense. If you look in the context, call no man father. Those are clear, incompatible, contradictory ideas. What about the exaltation of people such as Mary or Peter or Mother Teresa, venerating them and putting them on a pedestal, maybe making statues of them and, and praying to them. Matthew 4, verse 10, 
Jesus clearly said, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Revelation 19.10, uh, John started to fall down before the angel because he was so impressed with the message of God. And the angel said, stand up. I myself am a man. Worship God. And then Acts, here's the clearest of all. Acts 10 verse 26, Cornelius is impressed that a, a, a Jew would come to his house to present the gospel. And when he comes in, uh, P uh, Cornelius falls down in front of Peter. Peter's, what, what did Peter say? Peter say, you want to kiss my ring like my funny hat too? No, that's not what Peter said. What did he say? Listen to Acts chapter 10, verse number 26. I want you to hear the words of the Apostle Peter, which is contrary to Catholic idea. Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. Now friend, we challenge you today to think about these ideas. People, you will, if you turn on the TV and watch Catholic people around the Pope, you will find them bowing down before him. You will find them kissing his ring or his hand, just making some big to-do about him and, and just glorifying him in some way. And yet here's Peter, the Apostle Peter. Cornelius comes into him and he falls down. He's just so impressed, so thankful. He falls down before him. Peter said, uh-uh. Stand up. I'm a man just like you. Friend, we need to realize this, that there's no big me and little you, or little me and big you. All men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. We all need the blood of Jesus. There is nobody higher up than anybody else. There's nobody lower than anybody else. We all can make the decision to follow God and to serve Him. And so today, we challenge you to get out your Bible. You just, you check these things. Check the Bible verses. Check these quotes we've given. Just check for yourself and see if these things are true and the verses you look up in the Bible say what we've said they say today, then friend, Catholicism and Christianity cannot be compatible. They are diametrically opposed on multiple levels. And so I encourage, our encouragement today is, if you realize that to be the case, then make the change. Leave the religion, the false religion of men, and obey the gospel of Christ. Become a Christian, a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ in your area. And friend, you can be sure by following the Bible and living true to the Word of God that one day you'll have a home with God in heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.